Greetings in Christ to you. Thanks for joining us for worship. We were closing out this series, Why God?, which has been a series of often tough questions, but necessary questions. We hope that this has equipped us for apologetics, to be able to explain what we believe in our faith, to practically engage with people around us who have similar questions, questions about God, about why we trust His Bible, why we can still follow Him even though there's science, why God would care about what goes on in our bedrooms or with our finances, why is there only one way to God? Why do we need Him? As we conclude this series, I hope that the questions like those actually don't end, but I hope that we are a church that is engaged in our hearts and our minds with truth and with reason and is able to engage the world around us and hear their questions and ask good questions back and really listen to people. That these are questions that we can engage in in community groups and in fellowship with brothers and sisters at this church and a church that is resource to answer these kind of questions and also know that it's great, not just okay, but it's great to ask questions, tough questions, questions that you might think are stupid, but the person next to you is like, man, I'm so glad they asked that question because I was thinking the same thing. And today we come to this final question, which in some ways seems very straightforward. And for many of you who are saints here today, I hope it is straightforward But I also hope that it's not old hat for you, but that even hearing this, the gospel proclaimed, this question about God dying for humans, that it will not just be fresh to us, but will continue to lead us in His truth, by His revelation, to respond to Him more truly, more wonderfully, more authentically in our praise for who God is, for what He has done what He has made us, and that very practically that we walk in even daily sufferings and daily struggles with hope, with peace, with truth, that God has changed our status, and He has also changed everything about us, that He has changed our whole world, that He has changed our eternity, and He's changed the here and now for us. So this question could be phrased kind of in two ways and kind of two separate issues that we hope we can get to today, depending on kind of where you put the accent on the question. Why does God have to die for me? What did I do? What was so bad that would take the death of God to fix it? I mean, that's a kind of a strange concept. What do I need God to save me for? I'm not drowning. I'm not suffocating. I'm doing okay. I'm not perfect. I'm no angel, but I'm no devil. Why does God need to die for me? That's a real question. That's a question that people around us might not even know how to put into words. And when we tell them this gospel truth, it's perplexing. It's confusing. It's downright offensive. Why does he have to die for me? And then in that same question, why does God have to to die. Why does God have to die? You might have heard this way that I have heard this commonly is, why couldn't he, quote, just forgive us? God's all-powerful. God is loving. Why would he do, in the words of some people, commit cosmic child abuse? Why would God require blood? I mean, isn't that something left over, some remnant from an old pagan culture, pagan society that believed that killing infants could appease the sea gods, or killing virgins could make things okay and bring favor and make it rain. I mean, are we really talking about a God who requires a blood sacrifice? There are churches, I have been part of them, where the entire pastoral staff said, actually, there is no such thing as atonement. That the God we serve, loving and kind as He is, would not require that of anyone. So it's a great question. Why couldn't there be another way 
to salvation with God. And as we do this for us and for the people we're sharing with, there's a lot of things we can't get into all of them today that we have to unpack. I mean, there's questions just about God's holiness, God's very character and nature. That's important to this question. As is, what does it mean that God was incarnate, that he took on flesh, that there is a God-man named Jesus? I mean, what is with that word, that phrase, that doctrine of substitutionary atonement? Forgiveness. Even sin in hell itself. Those are concepts that are tied into this question. So to look at this, let's, let's look at Romans chapter 5. The whole thing. It's 21 verses. It, it's not too long. And I think we need the context to kind of see this. And if we read it, I hope we'll see that it's amazing what God has done for us and help us answer this question practically and truthfully, biblically. We're in good company. Martin Luther has said about Romans chapter 5 that in the whole Bible there is hardly a chapter that has this same triumphant text. That there's hardly a chapter that can equal Romans chapter 5. And remember that as we look at this, even though we're reading a whole chapter and it seems like it gives us a lot of the context, actually Paul has started in chapter 1 and going through chapter 8 with his presentation of the gospel. And chapter 5 just falls into part of that as he's set up his case for the need for this. And remember that Paul is talking to people who are saints in the church in Rome. He's talking to people who are in church. And he's telling them this message. 5.1 is going to start with this expression, therefore. That's always a clue that if you have time, go back and read the chapters that came before this. Because he says, therefore, he's building on what he has said from chapters 1 through 4. And he comes to chapter 5 and says, therefore, since we have been justified. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith. Therefore, God has done something amazing. He has moved. And that part of this narrative throughout Scripture is this word, atonement, that God has been moving and seeking and making a way that His fallen humanity can return to a harmonious relationship with Him, an intimate relationship with Him, a just relationship with Him, an eternal loving relationship with God. So in chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type 
of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, we come today, we come to your revealed word that we might know more of who you are, that you would reveal yourself to us in the proclamation of your word. And in the hearing of your gospel, Lord, we might come closer to understanding who we really are, to know and embrace what we need most, and to respond in worship that you have met us in our greatest need for a Savior. Jesus, will you guard my mouth as I speak? Open up our hearts and our minds to hear what you are saying to us. And this we pray in your name. Amen. So as we come to this question, and as we share the gospel with anyone, we really have to start in two places with two simple questions. Who is God and who are we? Who is God really? I mean, who do you think he is? What do you think he wants? What do you think he's like? As we start to talk about why Jesus had to die for us, we have to start in the right place. Often we start with our felt needs or we start with our condition, but we need to start with the Lord himself. And the Bible is clear about his character, and one that rings out across Scripture is that God is holy that he's a superlative of holiness. He's holy, 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 and that there is no one like him. There has never been, and there never will be. There's no one on his level, no one parallel with him. And embedded in that word holiness is that God is, by his very nature, by his very person, disconnected from the rest of life, or a cut above, a cut apart, that he is separate in his perfectness, in his righteousness, in his holiness. And part of his holiness is that he is just and cares about justice. That is in holiness, he is a holy judge. That he loves us with a holy love. And that what he is concerned about when he wants us to follow him and be like him is that we will be holy people, people set apart that we will be people who are called saints, those who are simply set apart, and that we take on His nature, that we who are made in His image will respond to Him for who He is as a holy God. And that brings us to the second question, then who are we? We are creatures made by that holy God. We are creatures who were made with a divine inspired purpose, that we were created with meaning, created for a reason, that we are not accidental. We are not here to be the captains of our own ship and our own fate, but we are here to respond to that holy God. And the greatest response is in worship, which simply means responding to Him with all we are and all we have, right response to worship Him to trust Him, to seek after Him, 
to adore him. But we are creatures who have exchanged God's holiness for unrighteousness. We are creatures that have exchanged the Creator for created idols. That we are, as we heard last week talking about science, we are truth suppressors. It's not that this holy God has not made Himself evident to us, at least in a general revelation, but that we suppress the evidence. We suppress it because we do not want to be with that holy God. And in our condition, we are fallen people. We are fallen people to the point that when people in Scripture meet this holy God, even what we would call upstanding people, good people, they fall on their face and say, get away from me. I am going to die in your presence. I am unworthy. I am frightened. Not because God is big and scary, but because He in His holiness is so other. And in the radiance of His holiness and His glory, if we are to come into His presence, it is shocking because our unrighteousness is magnified. It's like a black light that goes on, and we didn't see all the filth and dirt that was there until we turned it on. So we rub shoulders with other human beings. We see some who are better than us, many who are worse than us, and we're kind of in the middle, okay. But when we come face to face with this holy God, there is a problem, there is an issue. And when we say things like that to people, that flies in the face of all that we want to believe about ourselves, doesn't it? To hear that you are a declared sinner. That we are people who do not only do evil, but are evil. We not only disobey, but are even called children of disobedience. We would much rather prefer to think of ourselves as people who are born good and get corrupted by our families, by our society, by our politicians, by our education. But remember something that we talked about last week. The right diagnosis leads to the right prescription, the right remedy, and the wrong one can lead to a very deadly prescription, a very deadly remedy. Well, the diagnosis is where we need to start. If we go out on the street, pick a town, and we start to ask people randomly, what is your biggest need? If you ask your friends, people in your family, what do you think is your biggest need? What do you need most? What would they say? It's best we don't guess, but we start to ask people. We might hear a number of responses. Some might say, my greatest need right now is to get a job. I need to pay bills. I need to get out of debt. I need to get a roof over my head and over my family's head. Some people might say, I'm lonely. My greatest need is for companionship. I need a mate. I need a spouse. I need my family to simply love me back. I need people to tell me that I'm okay. I need some good friends. I need comfort. Others might say, my family is a complete war zone. My husband is abusive to the kids and to me. My kids are disrespectful and disobedient. What I need most is peace in my home. Others might say, I need to be healed. My body is breaking down. I need physical healing is what I need most. Some might say, I need more freedom. I need to be accepted. Others today might say, I need to finally live how I want to live. I need to be the authentic me, the real me. My greatest need is to express myself and be accepted by the world for who I am. What you feel is your greatest need is going to lead you down a path to what you feel is your greatest solution to satisfy that need. An example in Buddhism so traditional Buddhism, the idea of the suffering of human beings, what's really wrong with us is attachment, attachment from desire. We desire things in this world. We desire them too much. The solution to that diagnosis then is to become unattached to this world, to cease desiring. Heaven is nirvana, which means a blowing out of a candle, of a flame, you to be extinguished. 
The great answer is to have no desire even further to realize, to awaken that this world is not real anyway. Diagnosis leads to prescription. What's wrong with us? What do we need? The Bible tells us that it is sin, that it is sin. Oftentimes today, I hear and I experience and I know and I hear from other people that there's a lot of churches that don't preach about sin or this is not really popular. And some people say, well, the answer is because there's itchy ears and it doesn't grow churches. And I, I, I will say that's true. But I think there's another issue going on. I feel if I'm being, I think, real, I think a lot of pastors, a lot of churches have just forgotten that this is actually our biggest problem. The diagnosis has gotten off. And that changes our ministries, that changes our teaching, it changes our preaching if we get off the diagnosis. Now, Paul has talked about sin repeatedly in chapter 5, and the Bible has more facets to talk about sin than we can cover today. But in short, it's a willful breaking of God's revealed law, God's revealed way. And important is revealed. Remember the condemnation of chapter 1 in the scene is God's, Paul has said, Everyone knows generally that there is a God, but they suppress it. He has revealed himself in his creation. When it comes to Adam and Eve, he revealed to them. He didn't just put them there and say, figure out which tree. He told them, this is life, this is death, don't cross that line. This is the way with me, and that's the way with Satan. He revealed that. And then Satan came and twisted a revelation or made his own revelation to them, and they bought into it. The word that comes in chapter 5 is that there is a transgression or a trespass. He says that this one man, which is including men and women, the word, men don't feel bad, it wasn't just us. But he says that the transgress, the trespass has been that there is a crossing of the line, so to speak, in the sand, that God has demarcated what is holy, what is righteous, what is right, and human beings have transgressed that, have trespassed that, have stepped into a land that they should have never stepped into. Connected to this is the idea of sin is that it's rebellion. Isaiah 1-2 says, I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. That there is a rebellion. Paul even uses the term sons or children of disobedience. If you remember, we looked at Ephesians 2. It has made us enemies of God. And this rebellion really defines us as people set against God. Not only people who do wrong, but people who are at enmity with God, who have hostility towards Him. And God the King, and I set up my rival little fiefdom and get my little army and say, I will go against your way. I will defy your rule. I will not pay you tribute. I will not give you right worship. Satan and angels rebelled against God in heaven. They rebelled against his holy reign and his rule. And we have done the same thing. It's just a different stage. It's earth. But our sin is rebellion against him. First Timothy translates this kind of rebellion as apostasy. That apostasy at its root is you fall away from the truth. You rebel against the truth of God. Not that it hasn't been revealed to you, but you rebel against it with a false teaching. Connected here, too, is treachery, adultery, that we have cheated on God in sin. We have broken his trust, and we do not trust him to fulfill our needs, but have tried to fulfill them elsewhere with other spouses, so to speak. The Bible talks about it as iniquity, as abomination. There are certain sins that God talks about is particularly reprehensible to him. We often say all sin is the same, and I agree, all sin is mortal and leads to death. But the Bible does talk about particular things that God finds as absolute abominations, that if we could give him human emotions, he's revulsed by them. He wants to puke when he sees them or hears them, and he turns away. Gives us a better insight in those verses when we say that on the cross, God looked away from his own son, Jesus Christ, as he took upon the abominations of the world, the sins of this world. Another part that is connected to that rebellion, to that treason, 
and that transgression is the most common usage, is that we fail to hit God's standard, His target, that God has made a mark. This is maybe the most common literal definition of of sin in the Bible. And it is the picture of an archer trying to hit a target and continually misses. But what's important in this usage is not only that human beings fail to meet God's holy standard, but that there's an intentional decision to fail. There's culpability for us. We are to blame for not simply saying, that's too hard, I can't live up to that. But at the heart of this word and its usage in Scripture is, I do not want to. That the archer misses God's target, not because it's too small or too far or too high, but because he's aiming at a different target. He finds another thing which he will set his life upon and to find identity and meaning and truth. Another thing which seems to be the solution to his problem, his diagnosis. This word hamartia in Greek is that this sin is always against God foremost because it's his standard that he has set. It's against his holiness. It's against his righteousness. It's against his way. And that is deliberate that we disobey. A last meaning that is important to know is perversion. That in sin, like apostasy, there's a twisting and a bending is the root of that word. There's a bending and a twisting of what God has said and also his law. But what happens in sin from that kind of picture is not only are we bending and twisting something, in the process we become bent and we become twisted. Sin is not merely an isolated act but it actually alters the condition of the sinner. That not only we do sin, but sin does us. That I don't merely sin and put it back on the shelf and say, that's enough of that for right now, but that sin has a way of twisting in my heart and mind and warping me and bending me to actually like it and crave it and seek after it. that actually becomes more and more my nature to sin, to crave sin, to find ways to sin, to defy God. Brothers and sisters, when we understand this about sin, I think it's one step more on understanding why could God not just, quote, just forgive us? I need more than just a do-over or a free pass or a ticket out of hell. I need to be transformed then. I need to be changed Paul tells us how sin came into the world, and he tells us what it does. This is also how it helps us understand what it means of what God has done for us and why he doesn't just snap his proverbial fingers and we're okay. Sin has separated us from God in verse 10, which is why we need reconciliation. We need reconciliation because we have been separated. There is hostility between us and God. We are Not only bad people, we are his enemies, also in verse 10. Verse 16, sin brings condemnation because we have trespassed his revealed law. We are deserving of his righteous wrath in verse 9. It's not a popular term, but God's wrath is not borrowed from a pagan culture. It's mentioned across Scripture. Again, is his righteous holiness set against injustice, set against unrighteousness. God is not an angry God in the sense that he's petty or vindictive, but because he is a just God and holy God, he has wrath against unrighteousness. Again, I like to think if you're a loving parent of any sort, if your child is ripped away and ruined and wrecked by an addiction to drugs, you are righteously angry at those drugs. You have a righteous wrath towards drugs in general and addiction because you've seen what it has done to your child. I believe that's where God's position is. It says it also brings brings upon us his judgment because we are unjustified before God. We are guilty. And sadly, 
It brings apart upon us death. Death that was not natural to humanity, but is a direct result of sin. That sin has caused death in this world and has spread to all men. So that brings us to what is really our real problem. What is our real problem? The greatest mountain facing us today is what will a holy, just God do with all of that sin? What will he do with us? If he is just, if he is righteous, if he is a good judge, can he really just let it go? Again, if your son or daughter was in a horrific car accident by a drunk driver or they were murdered by someone and the judge stood up and said, you're forgiven, just go out to court. Has righteousness been served? Has justice really been served? But they were just forgiven. It brings us again to this diagnosis of what is really wrong with us and then what could be the solution. I want you to hear something. This is from an apostle of a certain church, Wilford Woodruff. Listen how it starts and then listen how it finishes. This is the solution. But man, having transgressed the law of God, justly entailed upon himself the curse of disobedience. So far, so good. From which he was incapable of redeeming himself. Good. Neither could any less than an infinite sacrifice atone for his fall. Checks out. We can receive the gift of exaltation only through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Here's the kicker. And our obedience to the laws and ordinance of the gospel. We should, as a people, be awake to the fact that our Father in heaven has done all he could for the salvation of the human family. But in order that they may be benefited by his death, and that his blood may cleanse them from all actual sin committed in the flesh, they must abide the law of the gospel. In order to obtain salvation, we must be obedient and faithful to God's precepts. If I ever obtain to a full salvation, it will be by my keeping the laws of God. That's a Mormon apostle. That's Mormonism. You see how easy it is to get off track. You start in the right place. You need atonement. Yes. Why? Because of sin. And sin is so grave. It's going to take an infinite sacrifice. It's going to take God himself. But what they give with one hand, they take away with the other. And this is why we need to know this and be aware. This is why Paul is talking to these Romans who are already saved and already believed this. But what is our faith? Verse 6. Romans 5, for while we were still weak, while we were ungodly, while we were helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were helpless, while we were weak, When we had a debt that we could not pay. And that's the real question that comes to next is, I'm tracking with you. I've sinned against God. I need an atonement. But how much? And that's where we have to get down to this is, do you believe that this debt you owe God, if you could just get a little loan and give it enough time, give enough education, give enough chance, you could work it out and be able to pay him back? Do you just need a little starting capital? Or are you so bankrupt in sin, so dead in trespasses, you need nothing less than a Savior, a complete Savior? Do you believe that Jesus just opened the door for you and then it's up to you to do the rest? Because that's a gospel that sounds very, very appealing. God opened the door, you do the sacraments. God opened the door, You work the law. If you do this, then God will do that. Or is it this? For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought 
justification. This is the great word, justification. There are many words here. I wish we had more time to go over. Awesome words. I've done my best to put short descriptions on our community group handout here. And if you get the digital version, it wasn't work on the paper. You can click through and get some fuller definitions. And I encourage you to continue to look into these things, these words. They're important. Paul repeats this word justification. And this word means that we are found just before a holy God. We are found righteous. This is a courtroom word. It means there's an acquittal. There is a non-guilty verdict once and for all. I don't need to pray into any courts in heaven. Jesus has won that for me. It is finished. I am justified. And how? Because of his righteousness. Because God has satisfied his perfect justice by not finding me just, but his just son, the perfect Jesus Christ. What is a holy God to do with unholy people? How can God remain just and a good judge and yet wipe away sin? How can he deal with sin without crushing us, without annihilating us? How could he justify us? Paul has told us here repeatedly because he has found Jesus just and Jesus perfect. When we put our trust in Jesus Christ through faith, which means when we believe he is who he says he is and he accomplished what he says he has accomplished, that's what it means to put your trust in him and believe in him. We are justified because his righteousness covers our iniquity. His righteousness is credit to us. We are not saved because of our righteousness. We are saved while we are still helpless, while we are still sinners. Though guilty in sin before God, we are counted as justified because of Christ's atoning work on the cross. Our faith does not justify us. Christ justifies us. We are justified freely by His grace, completely. And that verdict is once for all. Grammatically, it's once for all. Across Scripture, it's once for all. Jesus' death is critically important for our justification. That we can stand now before this righteous God without condemnation. That is amazing. That is amazing. And he goes on to say that we have peace with God. We have reconciliation. He uses both those words that we who were hostile to God, who were enemies of God, now have peace with him. And this isn't the peace of the Holy Spirit that if you are a Christian, you experience when you worry or the peace that is abiding in you. He's talking about your status with God. The war has ended. This is not a temporary treaty. It is a forever treaty that is now a covenant. It's a permanent peace. That this partition that separated you from God has been dropped down forever, never to be put up again. That you can now enter into his throne room, his mercy seat, so much so that you can call him Abba to his face directly with no other intermediary but our Lord Jesus Christ. We were separated from God in enmity and strife fighting this petty battle against him. We were rebels who hated God. But this is the good news. He has reconciled us to himself. He does the reconciling. Brothers and sisters, what this means is in justification, we are forgiven. The slate, so to speak, is wiped clean. But Christianity doesn't end there. It's not that I just get out of hell or I am just forgiven, even though it's a very big just. But he says, you have now not just been free to go live your own life again and try over. You have been reconciled to be with the God who made you to be with him. You have been reconciled to have an intimate, loving, personal relationship with the God who knows your name and knows the hairs on your head. The God who died for you and remade you. This is important because it says that even in God, we have friendship with him. Because of Christ's atonement. goes on that we have hope, that we can even rejoice in hope. This hope is not a wishful thinking. This hope is an assurance, a confident assurance. Paul says very practically, 
Back in verses 3 and 4, even in your present situation of suffering and struggle, know and hope that your life is secure in Jesus Christ. And that actually even your suffering, He is using to perfect you. That even in suffering, even when your world is falling down, you have hope in the person of Jesus Christ who does not change, who has redeemed you and will not lose you, will not forsake you. This is why if you've come out of any past church tradition that talks about venial sins and mortal sins, every sin is mortal. It kills you and separates you from God. But brothers and sisters, rest assured in the truth and the hope you cannot lose your grace from God. You cannot lose the salvation from God. You cannot. I know if I could have, I would have already. And this is the great hope. He says you have hope in God And here's the proof. You see the love that he has poured into your heart in that personal relationship and has given you the Holy Spirit. This is covenant language. God is now at peace with you in this new covenant of grace. He has poured his love into your heart and he has sealed, has given the down payment of the Holy Spirit. If anything comes to you, if anything questions you, I haven't done enough to please God. I don't know if I'm right with God. He says, I have given you the Holy Spirit this comforter and truth and this seal that this is real, it has happened. We don't need to cry out, Holy Spirit, please come. He dwells in us now, brothers and sisters. Now. And Paul has said, here is the seal, the covenant. He goes on to say, I wish we had time. He will make you righteous, verse 19. And just wonderful words, verse 21. Eternal life. Eternal life in our atonement by Jesus Christ. We sang, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, he is risen. Isn't he wonderful, this Savior? Sing hallelujah, you have been forgiven. You have been forgiven because Jesus Christ has died and resurrected. These are awesome words, brothers and sisters, to dive into the richness of and look at that the central message of the Bible is that God has been working towards bringing his lost creation back into this harmonious relationship with him, this enduring relationship, intimate relationship, loving relationship, that it is personal and it is also a community of believers, all of us here together. Atonement can be summed up in this, 1 John 4.10. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It's God's love that both motivated him to move and produce the sacrifice of atonement necessary for him. There is a greater question here. It will be in the, in the community group Bible study. I wish we had just another 45 minutes, but we don't. The great question is, why did Jesus have to take on humanity to die for us? Check out Hebrews 2, especially verses 10 through 18. Hebrews 2, verses 10 through 18. And it uses this word that Jesus is a propitiation for our sins. He's a propitiation, which means that he covers over that sin. He expiates it. He gets rid of it. He gets it out. But he propitiates. He covers it with God. And what this means, brothers and sisters, is that holy, just God doesn't sacrifice any of his holiness or any of his justice, and yet we can come into his presence because Jesus has been the propitiation, the covering of us that satisfies the wrath of God, that satisfies the judgment of God. Why did he have to take on human flesh? Why couldn't God do it another way? Well, Hebrews 2 tells us, again, Jesus didn't come to die for angels. He came to die for people. And in God's mercy, God's wisdom, he wanted a substitute. And animal blood would never do. It was never supposed to do. It was not plan A. It was a sign and type pointing to Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2 tells us that Jesus had to take on complete humanity, that he is the God-man. He didn't just seem human. He wasn't a human who was a little bit righteous, He is completely God and completely human, and he is then 
the only person who is able to be that high priest to make that sacrifice. The only high priest who doesn't need to make a sacrifice for himself, but is for us. Brothers and sisters, again, our our biggest problem in life is not boredom. That's not why people don't come to church. It's rebellion. It's not our family's relational strife. It's our own spiritual tyranny. Our problem is not financial mismanagement, but spiritual bankruptcy. It isn't our addiction to drugs. It's our addiction to ourself. It's our rebellion against God. Our great problem is sin in the face of a holy God. Which is why today, if you do not know that peace, there is no magical word, there is no right family you have to be born into. It's humbling and it's disconcerting, but I can't convince any of you that this is true. By some of your amens, I know that you believe it. But for all of us who love people who need to hear this gospel, we can't get their fingers out of their ears for them. We can't open up their hearts. But I'm not embarrassed of this gospel, even though it includes a God dying on a cross for me in true blood sacrifice, because this is the power of God for salvation to all who will believe, brothers and sisters. The Christian life should be centered on this reality. The Son of God took on flesh to die for us, whose flesh had rebelled against God, so that we could have eternal life through Christ. This is the great exchange. We who were enemies are now sons and daughters. We who were so far from God are brought near in his love and covenant. We who hated him have been transformed into his people. We who were unrighteous are now justified before him. Let this be the center of our life, brothers and sisters, center of our worship, center of our homes, center of our praise.